church. Welcome to Sunrise. Uh, my name is Aaron. It's good to be with you guys this morning. I know it's a little earlier than normal, but uh, you guys are the early risers, I guess, here at 9 a.m. If you're joining us online, welcome. Uh, I don't know about you guys, though. I woke up a little bit sleepy today. Anybody that spring forward just kind of hits you like a ton of bricks sometimes. Amen. Can I get an amen in here? No, maybe not. Maybe you guys are too bright and awake for today. Uh, I guess I'm the only one. Um, but as I was as I was thinking about this weekend and, and I was reading uh, Pastor Paul's message this week, reflecting on songs and what we should sing and, and just what God would have for us, um, man, I was just thinking about being tired, being worn out, being worn thin. And uh, it feels like the groundhog lied to us, you guys. Uh, I don't think it's an early spring, or at least it doesn't feel like it some days. And that just kind of brings everything down a little bit at times. But, you know, we have a faithful God. And this is the passage that reminded me of that this week. And even this morning, this is where he had me. Isaiah chapter 40 says this, God doesn't come and go. God lasts. He's creator of all you can see or imagine. He doesn't get tired out doesn't pause to catch his breath, and he knows everything, inside and out. He energizes those who get tired, amen. He gives a fresh start to the dropouts. Even young people tire and drop out. Young folks in their prime stumble and fall. But here's the important part. Those who wait on the Lord, they get a fresh start. They spread their wings and soar like eagles. They run and don't get tired. They walk and don't lag behind. Part of what we get to do as God's people is just to spend it, time in his presence, to wait on him. And maybe this morning that's what you needed to hear. Just to be reassured that you have a faithful God who gives you the energy that you need, who gives you the life that we long for. And so I just invite you into this time as we worship together, church. <laughs> Okay. 
that you're awake, while you're standing, take a minute, say hello to the people that came to church with you this morning, and then Pastor Paul is going to be right back in just a moment. Well, good morning. Good to see you. Glad that you're here with us. You're like, he's talking in the darkness. Yes. Uh, today I'm going to deliver the sermon as if I was Bane. I was born in the darkness. Okay, so some of you have seen Batman. The others of you are like, yeah, I've seen it. That still didn't sound like him. So nice try. Don't quit your day job, Paul. Um, now we're jumping into, or not jumping into, this is our second week of in our seven rhythms of the rhythm of telling our story. So just to kind of kind of give you a recap of what our strategy is for this year is we're taking seven times or seven months, seven kind of segments of sermons to talk about the seven rhythms of the Christian faith. These are the patterns we need in our life to grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ. These are not things we grow past. These are things we grow up in. We continue these rhythms in our life. January, we talked about Bible reflection. Uh, in February, we talked about prayer. And now we're talking about telling 
our story. And we're going to get to the other fours as the you know, year goes on. And we've been kind of adopting this lecture and lab kind of strategy. Here's what I mean by that. What we mean is as we walk through the sermon topics or walk through the seven rhythm topics, we are going to uh, be, in a sense, lecturing Right, giving sermons about uh, this material so to help you understand the principles behind it. But then we're also taking a lab strategy, which means at the end of the month, we're going to have an experience that we're going to invite you into so you can live out what you've learned. In January, we did that with releasing the trail guide to get you into God's word at least three times a week, studying his word that launches off from the sermon. And February, we did a 24-hour prayer experience, which was a great time. If you participated in that, we loved it. We enjoyed it very much. We're going to do that again this time. So we have a lab experience in telling our story. And this is what this lab is. The lab is actually a tool we're going to release to you on Palm Sunday. So the Sunday before Easter, we're going to release a tool for you to help you shape your story. Because we want you to share your story. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, we believe it's important that you share your story of following Jesus with those that you love. Your friends, your family members, your co-workers. God wants you to share your story. And sometimes it's hard for us to know how to shape that story so we can share it with others. So we want to help you um, walk through that. And so all these messages are helping you do that. And then we'll give you a tool to kind of help you work through that experience. Now... As we're talking about story, uh, I need to confess something that I told our staff a couple, couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were discussing as a staff about perspective. Perspective when it comes to how we share our stories and how we reflect on our stories. And what we were talking about as a staff, what we were discussing is that, that reality is like a, a beach ball. Okay. Here's what I mean by that. You know, if you think of a beach ball, it has a red stripe, it has a yellow stripe, it has a white stripe, it has a, a blue stripe. And so all these different stripes. And those stripes kind of represent our perspective. It's our awareness. And so oftentimes we have a piece of reality or awareness of reality or something that we've really neglected thinking outside. And we're only thinking of the stripe that we're standing on. But when we tell our stories, we kind of reflect back on just this part of a story. It's almost like we're standing on the beach ball and we look down and we say, oh, my stripe is red, therefore the whole ball is red. Well, no, that's not fair, right? Part of your, the ball is red, but not all of it is. There's a blue stripe, a yellow stripe, and a white stripe. And we're talking about our perspective and why it's so important to have other people in our lives to help us see the whole of reality. And so if we think about that when we apply it to our stories, Think about this, when you retell a story, or you reflect on a story, and you're thinking back to that reality, what stripe do you often emphasize? I'll confess, the stripe I like to emphasize is my heroism, right? Is, is, I am a hero in the story. Somebody laughed already, like, yeah, there's another stripe, Paul. Right? Thank you. I appreciate that. But we probably exaggerate that stripe now. we got to be honest. We've, you've done good things in your life. You've played the hero sometimes. Great. We probably exaggerate that part. We, that, we probably make that stripe a little too big. But we like to tell stories that make us the hero. And so I was telling our staff, I said, guys, I have to confess that when I reflect on my story and I'm retelling my story, I cast myself as a different character, not the hero. Maybe I think the hero is a hard sell. Like, people look at me like, you're not the hero of this story. What I often will do is I will cast myself as the victim of the story. I've been hurt. I've been wronged. This and this and this and this. And is that fair to do at times? Yes. Right? There are times that you, you have been the victim of somebody's sin. Somebody's wickedness, somebody's hurt, somebody's, somebody's hurt you. You've been in pain. Pain has been inflicted upon you. That stripe is true. Now, when we're telling our story about following Jesus, when we narrow our focus at the moment I stepped over the line and said, I'm following Jesus today, when we look at that story, we look at that beach ball, if you will, there's a stripe that is more true than us being a hero or us being a victim. It's us being the villain. When we came to faith in Jesus Christ, 
we had to come to grips with the awareness of our villainy. We had done things that were wrong, that we had offended God, and that we were personally responsible to handle that situation. And this is my encouragement to you today, is when you tell your story about following Jesus Christ, you need to show that moment that you became aware of your own villainy. When you became aware that you had offended God and that you had personal responsibility to do something about it. You couldn't hide behind the actions of others. You couldn't hide and say, but I was the victim. You, you couldn't hide and say, but, but I can hide behind my family's religious experience. You couldn't hide behind those. You had to step out in front in the light, just you and God. And you had to handle your business. Right? You had to take care of things. You had to bear responsibility. So that's what I want to unpack for you today. So if you write down one thing, I want you to write this down. This is the big idea for today. The big idea is this. Take sin personally. Take sin personally. Now here's what I mean by that. That word personally, I'm going to use it in two different ways. The first way I'm going to use it is this. We need to see that our sin is a personal offense against God. Sin is not just breaking God's law. Sin is not just a legal infraction is a relational offense to God. It is betraying God. It is hurting the heart of God. And we're going to see Paul, when he tells his story, when he talks about his conversion, his moment of following Jesus, that he took sin personally. He realized that his sin was a personal attack on God. The second way I want to use that word personally is he realized he was responsible to clean up the mess. He had to do something. He had to act. He couldn't hide behind the actions of others. He had to do something about it. So let's go to Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. If you're wondering, Paul, there weren't sermon notes out there in the front. There's a demon that has possessed our printer. Uh, if you feel equipped, whether with a hammer or holy water, to handle that demon for us, we would appreciate it. You can exit the service now. We will equip you, and then you can go fight that demon. Uh, so that's why we don't have, there are sermon notes. They are online, uh, so you can reference uh, them that way. Uh, or you can just follow along and follow the smooth voice of your pastor. Um, you're like, you no, know, please give me the notes. Uh, so let's go Acts chapter 22. We're going to start with verse 6. That's where we're going to pick up. We're halfway through, or not halfway through, but we're, we're in the second part of Paul's speech. And we've broken up our story as in the before, faith, and after. That's how we we're breaking it up. So last week we talked about the before moment. We need to share our rap sheet and not our resume. That was our big idea for last week. We need to start with our sin. We need to show people, hey, I'm not here to impress you, but I'm here to connect with you. I'm here to relate with you. I'm here to empathize with your brokenness. We need to share our rap sheet, our sins. In fact, this is a great doorway for us to relate to other people. Hey, I struggle with a similar struggle as you. Let me tell you how Jesus has helped me with that. And now we're talking about that second part, the moment of faith. And this is where we kind of build off what we did last week. This is where we realize the personal offense that our sin was against God and how we needed to take action. Okay, so that's where we're unpacking. Look at verse 6. So Paul has gone through and he's told uh, this group of Jews who really want his blood. They want him to suffer. He's told them, I relate to you. I understand your zeal. I was zealous too. I used to persecute the church. And then Paul tells them the story of his confrontation with Jesus and the moment he became a Christian. So that's where he's at in his story. Verse 6. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus. So he's journeying on the road to Damascus. He's going to Damascus to persecute Christians. That's his goal. That's his, that's his job. About noon, a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground. And I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now I want to hang out right there in that last phrase, whom you are persecuting. This kind of doesn't make sense. We're in Acts 22. Paul is recalling an event that was recorded in Acts chapter 9. And what Paul is being confronted with here is that 
he, in persecuting the church, is persecuting Jesus of Nazareth. Now, the reason why this is odd is because Jesus, in Acts chapter 1, was resurrected and he was ascended. He ascended in Acts chapter 1, which means he went to heaven. In Acts chapter 7, we have Stephen, one of the first martyrs of the Christian church, right before he was going to die, or as he was dying, he looked up and he saw a vision, a heavenly vision. And in that heavenly vision, he saw Jesus. So where is Jesus of Nazareth right now? He's in heaven. So in Acts chapter 9, how is Paul persecuting Jesus Christ? When Jesus Christ has been in heaven for several years probably at this point. How could this work? The reason is, is because Paul is now aware that Jesus Christ is saying, your attack on my church is an attack on me. Do you see the connection there? Jesus takes this sin personally. You hurt my followers, that's like hurting me. Now I want to pause here for a moment. I want to zoom out look at other scriptures. Because this is very important for us to understand. And I think we need to get the weight of Paul's emotional whiplash that he's dealing with right now. Yes, this experience is blown away, like sensory overload. He's seeing a light. He's seeing a voice. He's actually blinded by this experience. There's, there's sensory overload here. But the message is giving him identity whiplash. Paul thinks that he is persecuting this movement as a heretical movement, as a movement that is actually hurting God. And so he wants to hurt the movement that he believes is hurting God and on his way to do what he thinks is noble and right and a good thing, he actually is confronted with the resurrected Christ who says what you're doing is actually a sin against the Lord. So Paul is like totally confused. I thought I was helping God and I'm hurting God? And not just his cause, but he is taking this offense as if I were inflicting pain upon him. He said, why are you persecuting me? Now go, go to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9. I want to show you how there's this personal connection. God takes sin personally. It's not just an infraction against his legal code. It's not just breaking a law that's detached from God. We see this when God talked to Noah. After the flood, God had dealt out a severe judgment upon the people that it says in Genesis, he regretted making because their hearts were continually wicked. And he mourned over that. And as he's talking to Noah about uh, what would be kind of the rule of the land, he gives him a prohibition against murder. And he tells him the consequences that somebody will have to face if they take the life of another. And what I want to focus on is how he grounds this very severe consequence. And, and I want you to think of it in light of what Jesus is saying to Paul on the road to Damascus. This is Genesis chapter 9, verse 5. It says, for, And for your lifeblood I will require, require a reckoning from every beast. I will require it. And from man. What he's saying is, if somebody hurts you, whether it be a beast or it be a man, and this is mankind, I will require a debt. If your life is taken, I will require life. From his fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Verse 6, whoever sheds the blood of a man, by man shall his blood be shed. If you take a life, your life will be taken. Now look at how he grounds this. Look at how he grounds this consequence. Here's why this is going to happen. For God made man in his own what? Image. This is different. Man is the apex of creation, if you will. He's the, the culminating work of creation. God has made man in his image. That makes us categorically different than any other species out there. No other species has the image of God on it. Only humanity. So when a life, animal life is lost, it is not an attack on the image of God. 
So the consequences for such an action, and there are consequences. The scriptures talk about that. We're not going to get into those. But it's not this consequence. What God is saying is, man still has my image on him. Now, what's crazy about this part of the story of the Bible is that man has shown himself to be continually wicked. So which tells us there is brokenness in humanity, but there's still beauty in humanity. That as vile as a human heart can get, there is still some residue of the image of God on every human heart. Which gives that person integrity and value to strike against humankind, to strike against humanity, is an attack on the image of God. Jesus uses similar language too in a different way when he's talking about kindness. He tells his followers, he said, if, if you do this to the least of these my brothers, you've done it to me. If you act kindly to one of my followers, it's like you're acting that way to me. See, we see how God takes kindness and cruelty personally. Now, we can empathize with this. Like, we get this. If you roll up to my house, you knock on the door, and one of my little boys answers the door, and you just punch him in the face. I know. Why did you do that? Don't take communion today, okay? That's wrong of you. <laughs> but like, if you hit my kid or you hit my wife, have you only sinned against them? No, you've sinned against me too. Like I take that as a personal offense against me as a father and as a husband. If you attack my family, that's an attack on me. This is what God is saying. To strike against humanity is a strike against me. I take this personally. Okay, now the next, couple, or the next passage I want to get to shows the real um, emotional hurt that God feels from this. He takes sin as a personal attack, and there is an emotional weight to it. Okay, now I have to say I want to give warning here because the language of Scripture here is mature. Okay, so if you have a little one um, in the service, that's great, that's awesome. This may be the time to... Go check them into our children's ministry. Uh, and I don't, I don't want to, here's what I'm not doing. I'm not apologizing for biblical language. I'm just telling you that you may have to explain the word that God chose to use um, when he referred to the emotional pain he felt when his people sinned against him. It's not vulgar, but it may not be a word in your child's vocabulary. And so you may have a conversation at lunch. You're welcome. Okay? But I wanted to give that warning because I wanted to be fair to anybody. So if you want to step away, let's go to uh, uh, um, Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 16. It's going to take me a time to get there. I'm going to read several verses. So if you want to step away, that's fine. Check your child in. Child care is awesome. You'll get back by the time I get to that part in the verse. So we'll go to Ezekiel chapter 16. And we're going to start with verse 8. I, I, this passage actually means a lot to me because Ezekiel was actually one of the first books I read when I became a follower of Jesus Christ. And I remember getting to like 16, 17, and 18, and I was like, what book am I reading? This is wild. Uh, so it's in that realm. Uh, and I actually picked the most PG part of, by the way, this chapter. So I just want to throw that out to you. Um, so if you have your Bible, watch your kid's eyes. Don't let them read the first eight verses before it, Okay. That's on you as a parent. Um, so here's verse 8. God is describing his relationship to Israel. And you're going to hear this very personal attachment he has to Israel. And he, it's a romantic attachment. And he's going to talk about how much he has done for Israel. Okay, so, and I want to read a good portion of scripture here. Because I really want you to feel the heart of God hurt when it comes to the betrayal that sin is. Okay, so let's just walk here. This is Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 8. I think what God is talking about here in this moment is he's actually talking about the Exodus. When he delivered his people from Egyptian slavery, brought them through the wilderness and into the promised land. I think that's the time period that God is talking about. He said, when I passed by you again and saw, behold, you were at the age of love, the age of maturity. And I spread the corner of my garment over you. And I covered your nakedness. 
And I made a vow to you to enter into covenant with you, declares the Lord. This is why I think when God is talking in Exodus 19, I will be your God and you will be my people. He made an agreement. I think he's talking about Sinai here. The Sinai experience was God's marriage pledge to the people of Israel. That was a wedding ceremony, if you will. That's what I think he's talking about. I made a covenant with you, declares the Lord God, and you became mine. Hear wedding bells. Ding dong. Okay. Um, then I bathed you with water. Think of the Exodus. I bathed you with water and washed off the blood from you and anointed you with oil. And I clothed you with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk. And I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. God, like, bling. This is bling. God is blinging her out. Uh, Verse 12. And I put a ring on your nose. Nose rings are biblical. It's right there. Uh, So dads, I'm sorry if they ask, okay? You're like, I wish I would have checked my kid into children's ministry. Okay, I put a ring on your nose, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and the clothing was of fine linen and silk, embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour and honey and oil. You grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. This is the kingship, I think, of Israel. And your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty. Think of the wisdom of Solomon. And for it was perfect, though the splendor that I bestowed on you declares the Lord. Wow. Okay, so you feel all of this beautiful ceremony, right? God redeemed them, washed the blood off them. And look at verse 15. Okay, here's the strong part. But you trusted in your beauty and you played the whore. Because of your renown and lavished your whorings on any passerby, your beauty became his. Do you hear the heartbreak there? What God is describing here is, is, like, is like a woman using her wedding dress to pick up some random guy at a bar. That, that's, what's being, that's the emotional weight that God is talking about here. See, this is something I think that at, at times, maybe it's just in our Western mind, we, we lose the idea of what disobedience is. You know, we, we treat it like, 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 like an officer giving a ticket, right? There was somebody who um, forgot the speed limit near Brookwood Elementary School. He won't be named, but his initials are... Pastor Paul Robert Crandall. And uh, as I was driving, uh, turns out it's 20 is the speed limit. Uh, Not 25. Yes, it's a school zone. I know. Sinner in the hands of an angry God. That's me. Uh, So I, (laughs) such a goob, right? So I'm driving and I'm like listening to the radio. I'm talking to my daughter. I'm banging on the steering wheel. I'm not saying Taylor Swift was playing, but maybe it was playing and we were enjoying that. And, And I'm going 26. Oh, and, and, and I pass a cop and I look at him like, what's up, dude? And I'm like, yeah, that's me. And he immediately turns his lights on. And I'm like, what'd you do? You know, like, immediately I just threw it at my daughter, Alexine Ann Crandall. What are you doing? Wrong. She's like, dad, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know. You tell me what's going on. And I pulled over and he's like, do you know what the speed limit is? I was like, I feel like I don't, uh, <laughs> you know, and. And, you know, he's a nice guy. Um, I have a friend who's a police officer, so I dropped his name. Uh, I I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I promise I didn't do that. I was like, I go to Sunrise Church. I was on my way to a prayer meeting. (laughs) Um, And, uh, no, and and I just told him, I was like, dude, my bad. I I forgot. I'm sorry. I do apologize. And, uh, and, And he walked back with my registration, and I told my daughter, I was like, well, daddy's probably going to get a ticket, and that's the right thing because I was wrong. He came back. He was gracious. Now, I didn't take anything personal with the cop. Like, he's doing his job. He's doing his thing. And I told him, I was like, he's doing the right thing. But I don't know this guy. And I didn't take speeding like, like I had hurt him. And I think there are times, like, we take this kind of judicial theme and we apply it to God. As if God has these, like, arbitrary rules for speed limits. 
right? Like, okay, sometimes it's going to change, sometimes it's not going to change, right? And so we treat these infractions as if they're just uh, legal variants, you know? Like maybe the law will change later. Okay, it's a school zone, so I'm in trouble. <laughs> like, but that is not how Scripture talks about sin. In fact, the dominant theme, especially if you read the prophets of the Old Testament, the dominant theme in describing idolatry, the worship of another God, is in the terms of adultery. When God sees sin, he sees it as an attack against him. We have personally offended the lover of our soul, not just the lawgiver of the universe. Our sin is adultery. Our sin is loving another. Our sin is giving our heart to something else besides God who deserves it and who has lavished us with abundant blessings like he did to Israel. Sin is relational betrayal. And in your story of when you became a Christian, there was a moment that you felt the weight of your villainy. You felt the weight, the personal infractions that you had against God, just like Paul did. Paul was confronted, I mean blindsided, by this divine encounter with the resurrected Christ. And he was made fully aware, your sins are against who, Paul? It's not just against these churches. It's not just against Stephen, who you saw stoned to death in Acts chapter 7. Your sin wasn't primarily against the one who you saw stones hurled at his head until he was dead. It's not just against him. You were approving the stoning of Christ. That's what you're doing. I remember this. I remember coming into just a brutal awareness of my sin. See, like, I did experience, I was a, a, a victim of hurt. There were several things that happened to me that, that, that were not right, that were not okay. But those, those things made me a villain. Like that hurt made me hurtful, made me angry, filled me with rage. I once um, chased somebody down with a knife because of my rage. I didn't catch him, but I chased him down. At one point, I... Uh, Stabbed a piece of furniture in our house with a knife until my arms couldn't stab anymore. I was filled with so much anger, so much rage. And I remember on April 4th, 1997, I remember unleashing all of that rage, all of that anger against God. Like I just got in the ring with him. And I was like, look, dude, you stink. Now, I didn't use, there were different words I used, okay? But I'm not going to have you, have like, got to check my kid in again. I just got him out, right? But I remember, like, just, just letting it out. Like, ah, everything, all the hurt, all the pain, all the rage. And then there was, like, this switch. And I feel like it was that moment, like, like Paul experienced. Where it's like, God showed to me the weight of my sin against him. And I was blindsided by the amount of anger I had let nurture in my heart that I let grow. Yeah, sure, I was a victim, but I couldn't hide behind the actions of others. I needed to stand in the light and see the villainy that I had allowed to grow in my heart. The anger I had allowed to grow in my heart. The rage I allowed to grow in my heart. And I'll tell you, on that night, April 4th, 1997, I'll never forget that moment. It was like the crushing weight of my guilt. I remember thinking, I've done it. Like, I'm undone. I'm guilty. Before God, I am not innocent. I've sinned against him. And he has every reason to judge me. When we tell our stories, we have to tell of that moment. That's that's the stripe on the beach ball. We cannot forget that we realize we came to be aware of our own villainy, our confrontation with our own sinfulness. And then we had to take action. 
We had to do something about it. Let me show you this, how Paul, it kind of turns the corner. Once Paul sees this, once Paul is confronted by this, he takes sin personally. I personally sinned against you. And then he realizes, I need to do something personally about this. I can't hide behind the actions of other people. I need to step and move. Let's see how the story finishes off. Go to Acts chapter 22. Uh, we're in verse 9. And those who were with me saw the light, but did not, did not understand. And the voice of the one who was speaking to me. This is just important. This is a historical note. Paul's not having a vision. This is an ob- objective experience because his company is also experiencing this as well, but in a different way. If we pair this to Acts chapter 9, they saw a light but didn't see a person. They heard a voice, but they didn't understand the message. The point there is this is not a vision. This is actually an actual experience of the resurrected Jesus Christ. But Paul is participating in that experience different than his company. But his company is experiencing something. It's an objective experience of the resurrected Jesus Christ. Now those who are with me, I'm in verse 9 again. Saw the light, but did not understand. The voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, what shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, rise and go into Damascus. And there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me. And I came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, well spoken of by the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing to me and said to me, brother Saul, This is his name at this point. Saul's name will be changed to Paul. I've been referring to him as Paul. It's a good name. Receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and I saw him. And he said, the the God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one and to hear a voice from his mouth. Now, this is interesting here. The primary actors so far in this have been Jesus And Ananias, this prophet. Not Paul. Paul experienced the resurrected Jesus Christ. He experienced healing. Is he a follower of Jesus yet? No. And I think this is really important for us to understand. Because our experience is not enough. The actions of others are not enough. When we come into the light and say, God, I've personally offended you. We have to realize the weight of our guilt lies on our shoulders. And nobody can take that off us. We need to do something with it. We need to invite Christ to take it off us. But you have to do that invitation. It doesn't matter if your grandmother went to church, your dad goes to church, your your sister goes to church, your girlfriend, your boyfriend goes to church. They can't lift that. You stand alone between you and God. Just like Paul did here. He can't hide behind the actions of Ananias, the actions of Jesus. He's going to be called to action. He has to take his sin personally. He has to see his personal responsibility in it. Look at how Ananias makes this clear. Verse 15. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. I love this question. And Why do you wait? Why do you wait? Do you see? There's something for you to do, Saul. There's something for you to do, Paul. You have to step out. You have to take action. You've got to do something. You've been persecuting Jesus in persecuting the church. Rise and be baptized. And wash away your sins, calling on his name. Okay, let me just nerd out on this verse just for a second. We're going to leave that up there because I think this is important. I don't want us to read this wrong. I don't want us to read this as if it's saying that if uh, in baptism, that's the moment our sins are washed away. That's not how it works. And the grammar of this passage does not support that point. Okay, I'm going to teach you maybe some grammar terms that you may not know. And if you do know them, good for you. You're probably homeschooled. (laughs) Watch. Okay. Calling. Calling ends with an I-N-G, okay? That form of speech is called a gerund, right? Or a participle, okay? Were you homeschooled? No. No, okay. Well, I was wrong. Okay. So this participle is dependent upon a verb. The verb that it's dependent upon, which means the verb that it's explaining or that it's adding to, is the verb that comes right before it. That verb or action is wash away. 
Okay? So the question is, what does this participle do in helping us understand this action of this verb? This is what's called an instrumental participle, which means it tells us how this action is done. What are the means of action? So you can fairly translate it, and there is an English translation that does do this. I wish the other translations would do this. You have to know when translation committees do get together, they tend to give the most general uh, translation. I don't favor that because I feel like it, you're not helping the reader. Because in Greek, it's very clear what type of participle this is. But they leave it in a general way, which doesn't allow the English reader to really know what's happening. But there is an English translation, a very common English translation, that translates it this way. Washing away your sins by calling on his name. That's how we should understand this. So how are our sins washed away? Not by baptism. They are washed away by calling on his name. To be baptized is a totally different verb that stands alone from the washing away. It's an action that is symbolic of our sins being washed away. So the emphasis of this passage is Ananias to Paul. You have to call on the name of the Lord. Why? So your sins will be washed away. And then you need to be baptized, giving the symbol that your sins have been washed away. Now that phrase, calling on the name of the Lord, what does that mean? That is not an incantation. That's not a magical chant. It's not just saying the name Jesus. That's not the idea. Calling on the name of the Lord, we actually saw it in Acts chapter 2 when Peter delivered his sermon in Pentecost. Paul uses the same phrase in Acts chapter 10 when he's talking about his ministry to uh, the Gentiles and to the Jews. It's a central point of his preaching. This idea of calling on the name of the Lord comes from the prophet Joel in the Old Testament. Joel was talking about the judgment of God coming against his people. And the only way to escape that judgment, Joel says, was to call on the name of the Lord. The idea is cry out for help. Beg for mercy. That's what this means. So what Ananias is saying to Paul, you need to call out for God and say, I have personally sinned against you. I bear that weight and that responsibility. My actions against the church are actions against you, Jesus. I'm holding this on my shoulders. You've got to help me. Forgive me. Have mercy on me. Now, I remember April 4th, 1997. I remember that night where I felt the weight of my sin, my personal sin against God. I remember reaching out to my basketball coach. He was a Christian, went to church. I knew that. Took me to church a couple times. And I remember telling him, you've got to tell me about Jesus. Because I know I'm guilty and I know I'm going to hell. So tell me about Jesus. Which is an interesting phone call to get. Right? And he was like, I will be right over. And he came over. He came over at 11.30 at night. Came to my house. And he shared with me, this is what Jesus Christ has done for you, Paul. He died on the cross for your sins. He can take that guilt off your shoulders. See, this is what the cross does to us. It first humbles us before it ever gives us hope. Paul was humbled by what? He had persecuted Christ, the Lord, in persecuting the church. I was humbled by the weight of the rage that was in me. The anger and the bitterness that I let fester. That I let push people away from me. That I let outbursts come out that were not healthy and were not safe. And nobody was responsible for that but me. I couldn't hide behind, well, I was a hurt kid. And I want you to hear me. Like, I'm not diminishing any sense of victimhood that you may have in your life. I'm not diminishing that. I hope you don't hear that. I'm not trying to negate that. I'm not trying to say that all you are is a villain. I'm not trying to say that. I'm just saying that is a stripe on the beach ball. And at the moment of your conversion, of coming to Jesus Christ, that's the stripe you're standing on between you and God. You can't hide behind, well, you don't know who my parents are. You don't know who my history is. You don't know the church experience I have. You're right. I don't know those things. And those things are terrible. And those people are responsible for those things. But you can't hide behind the hurt And not deal with how you have missed the holy God. You can't. On that day of judgment, you'll stand and fall for what you have done. Not what's been done to you. 
And you can't excuse that behavior. You have to take your sin personally. And when you cry out for mercy, he will hear you. He will liberate you. And he will free you. Church family, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, don't forget this part of your story. Tell this part of your story. Talk about your sin personally. I betrayed God. I betrayed God. Not I was just, I was in a mess. Life was hard. No, 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 no. That's not, that's not the gospel. That's not the good Jews of Jesus Christ. Well, you know, I, I had this and this and life was rough. And you're talking about all these outside. No, 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 no. You've got to share how you are villain and not just victim. That's the gospel. That's what Paul experienced. And there was that moment you experienced that too. You have to share that when you share your story. Now, maybe you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ. I want to talk to you directly. And I want to set before you the question that Ananias set before Saul at that point, who became Paul. He asked him, why do you wait? Why do you wait? Now, hear me. I think there is good reason to delay a decision to follow Jesus. I know that may sound strange, but it's true. Jesus, in his preaching and his teaching, he told a crowd of people, count the cost before you come and follow me. What is he telling them? Hold on a second. Before you jump on this road of discipleship, before you jump on this road of following me, count the cost. It's going to cost you something. Know what this costs you. Understand the price tag as best as you can before you purchase this vehicle. Now, I believe that the reward of following Jesus is worth everything it will cost you. I've come to that conclusion. And maybe you have come to that conclusion. Like, you know what it would cost you to follow Jesus. So why do you wait? Why do you delay? What's really stopping you? I invite you, evaluate why. Is there a good reason to delay? And if there's not, then friend, today... Today is the day. Today is the day to call out on the name of the Lord. To take your sin personally. To realize you've offended God and you're responsible for that. And who will handle that guilt? Will that burden solely be on your shoulders forever? Or will you ask Jesus Christ to shoulder that burden for you through the cross? Why do you wait In a moment here, I'm going to pray a prayer. And if you want to cross that line and step into following Jesus for the rest of your life, I'm going to kind of hold your hand through that prayer. And you can make that decision today. Today could be your your road to Damascus day. Today could be your April 4th, 1997. Today could be the moment that you decide to follow Jesus Christ and you say there's no more waiting. Now, I'm going to do another prayer as well. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, I invite you to this prayer. As we were sitting amongst the staff, our staff on Tuesday, and we were discussing the message. We were discussing the text and what I had written so far. And um, We have wonderful staff here, by the way. Our staff felt like we need to end the service a little differently. And so I was like, okay, help me understand that. And I'm pretty sure the most brilliant person in the room, Marty, um, told us, and you could tell her that, uh, she came up with an idea, you know, what if we had a time of, of examination and confession? If we see Paul take his sin personally in this chapter, maybe we need to take our sin personally here. Now it's true, the moment you become a, uh, you have faith in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven, that's true. But when you sin after faith, it doesn't mean your relationship with God is severed, it's not cut off, but there's a distance that's created. And the more unconfessed sin you have, the larger that distance. It disrupts your fellowship with God. It doesn't break it, but it disrupts it. So the idea was that we would walk through a guided confession. Now, it's going to be a little abnormal. It's going to be a little different. It may be a little weird, maybe a little awkward, but that's okay. We're going to try it anyways. I'm going to walk through a prayer slowly, and I invite you to examine your heart. And to say, God, have I sinned against you in this way? And if that's happened, then just confess that to the Lord. Make sure your heart is clean. 
my pastor when I was young told me, Paul, the best advice I can give you in following Jesus, and I was a young, 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 young believer, he told me, keep your unconfessed, the list of your unconfessed sin as short as possible because you don't want to disrupt your fellowship with God. So that's what I'm inviting you to. Before we take communion, the symbols of Christ's death and resurrection for the forgiveness of sins, let's examine our heart and walk through that. So I'm going to invite you to do this. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads, to close your eyes. I'm going to give that first prayer. If you want to not delay and jump into following Jesus, I'm going to pray that first. And then we'll pray into the confessional part. And then we'll move to the rest of our service. So I should invite you kind of a discipline of silence and reflection. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. And let me guide us in this prayer. If you're, if you're at that point right now where you say, Paul, I do not have any reason to wait. There is no reason to delay. And you want to take the step, kind of draw the line in the sand and say, today I'm giving my life over to you, Jesus. If that's you in the room right now, you could pray a very simple prayer like this. Just, just in the silence of your own heart. Between you and God, you're talking to him. And my words aren't magical. They're only meaningful if they come from your heart. But you can pray a very simple prayer like this. You can pray, Father, I admit. I admit that, that I'm a sinner. I admit that I'm, I'm a villain. I admit that, that I have broken your rules. And I admit that I have personally hurt your heart with my sin. I believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again for the forgiveness of my sin. So today, today is my day that I call out on your name, Lord, and I confess you as the Lord of my life. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, or maybe you just prayed that prayer right now, I'm going to lead us into that different time, a time of confession. So I want you to focus your minds. Ask the Lord to search your heart. And pull up some things, maybe that, that, that need to be pulled up, to, to till up some ground that maybe is hard. And this is not going to, it's not going to be easy. But I, I do believe it will be fruitful if you yield to the Spirit's work right now. So you can pray this out to God. Again, between you and him in the silence of your own heart, you can say something like this. You can say, Father, have I sinned against you and sinning against my spouse? Lord, have I been bitter, impatient, and rude? Lord, have I said I forgive you with my mouth, but have I not meant it in my heart? Lord, have I sinned against you and sinning against my kids? Lord, have I been impatient? Lord, have I pushed away the invitations to play? Lord, have I overlooked their pain? Lord, have I sinned against you and sinning against my friends? Lord, have I lacked sympathy? Have I not been a great listener to their hurt? Have I not made time for their sorrows? Have I been indifferent to the struggles of sin that they have? Father, have I sinned against you and sinned against my coworkers and my neighbors? Has my pride to be better hurt them? 
Am I pride to outperform them, hurt them? Father, have I been embarrassed about my commitment to you before them? Father, have I sinned against you and sinning against my enemies? Have I forgot to pray for those who call, cause me pain? Father, forgive me of these sins that I have committed primarily against you. I stand in the confidence of the assurance of your mercy on the cross for me. It's in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. If there is anything that you feel in that moment has churned up for you, that you're like, Paul, I, I need more. We're going to sing a couple songs and I want you to sing them out. Be bold with them. But I'm also going to have some friends here in the first rows, our prayer partners. And if any time during these next three songs you feel like you just need, you need, you need more, man, I invite you. Just come forward. It's not weird. It's not awkward. And just sit down in the first row here and our prayer partners will be here to pray for you. If you made that decision to follow Jesus for the first time, I would love for you to share it with the person next to you. Share it with your friend that, that brought you or, or share it with one of our prayer partners here. We would love uh, to come alongside you in that. We're going to take communion. You're going to see communion in the front of the room, in the back of the room. Uh, you've examined yourself. If you, again, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I don't want you to feel any burden to take these symbols that you don't yet believe in. But I still want this time to be a time of reflection for you, a time of thinking. So if you need to sit and pray or, or you need to stand and sing or whatever it is, you're welcome to have some reflection in whatever way you feel is best for you. My church family, let's sing, let's give, let's pray, and let's take communion. Let's respond.
Jesus, you're my hope and stay. So teach my song to rise for you. When temptation comes my way, when I cannot stand, I fall on you. Oh, Jesus, you're my hope and stay.
It's like Paul said, we have some folks that are right up here up front, and uh, we don't want you to leave this morning without the opportunity to take the, the chance to be a part of the family of God. If God's been moving in your heart and today's that day, we don't want you to leave this space without doing that. And they would love the privilege, the honor that it is to pray with you, church. Or if you just need someone to pray with, uh, we, the, the time is still available. And, and take advantage of the opportunity just to spend time before God. If you're able, we just want to invite you to stand as we sing this last song, as we celebrate together as a church.
what a great truth. Jesus always called people to a commitment greater than they always were in. And today, this morning, you heard the word of God. God has spoken. And by his spirit, he may be tugging at your heart. But right now, I want to give you four ways that you can increase that commitment. The first thing is to note that on Easter Sunday, which is the 31st of March, the last Sunday of this month, we will have three services at 8.30, at 10, and at 11.30. Please bring a friend who would not normally be here. Secondly, any time between now and Easter, we're giving 100% of the week's giving to Africa New Life Ministries. Now, if you know anything about them, you know it's a very fruitful ministry. We've done this for them in the past, and we're doing it again. Give everything that you possibly can. I have no shame in asking you to give over and above you've ever given before. No shame whatsoever, because we're not keeping a penny of it. We're giving 100% of it away. And second, the last third thing is, we are going to be having baptisms today. We have a, a young woman who has committed her life to Christ, and she wants you to know of her commitment. There's this, what, what we were talking about, commitment to something greater than what you already know. Lastly, if you are here and you feel that tug in your heart, and you feel that God is calling you to a relationship with him, and you've never committed your life to him, come right now. Come at the end of this service. You can see the baptism on video, or you can come right now, even while I'm speaking, and say to any one of these people here in the front row, or the pastoral staff, or some leader, say, I want to commit my life to Christ. That's what we will leave you with. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. Go in peace. Amen.